This morning I want to begin with a text of scripture that I think is extremely meaningful to us in the times we're living in. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Can you hear me okay with this? Yeah. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22. First Corinthians fifteen twenty one and twenty two. It says, "For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the de of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive." What a comforting idea! The sin of Adam affected all of humanity. We were all, 60 centuries of us, in the loins of Adam when he fell. And through inheritance and through the law of fatherhood, somehow that's trickled down to us. We all partake of his nature, which is disposed to sin. We all have that problem, don't we? Every man born in Adam has Adam's sinful nature. And it's as natural for us in this state of sin it's as natural for us to sin as it is to breathe. Have you all had that experience? Yes, we've had that experience. However, God condemns no one because he was born in that first Adam. No one in the judgment is judged because he or she was born in sin. God is infinitely fair. We had no choice in the matter. But God made a provision for all of this. Think of it. Imagine it. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. You know, the human brain has a huge capacity to imagine things. Imagine this one. Ephesians chapter 1, 4 to 7. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 to 7. We've all been chosen. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to the adoption of children by Christ Jesus to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us according to the accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption, through his blood and forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Just as we were all in Adam, the first Adam, and inherit that sinful nature in him, just so God has gathered up the whole human family, the whole human race, and involved it in the sinless life of Christ made that wonderful provision for us, even before the world was, it says. And he has received us. Let's notice Romans chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. says virtually the same thing that we just read in Ephesians. Romans 5, 18 and 19. It says, therefore, as by the offense of one... Judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so by the righteousness of one. Who is that one, by the way? Jesus. Jesus. Even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men. How many men? All. all men. To justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. I'm, I'm told that that is in the present continuous tense. The many. The many were made sinners by the obedience of one. So many shall be made righteous. And the, if at the end a person is lost, it will not be because he was born into Adam's family. But rather because he chose to continue to entertain and cultivate that sinful nature that we all have been born with. When the sinless Christ was presented to him. John 3. We usually 
Look at this, John 3.16. I want to start with verse 17 this time. John 3, verse 17. Anybody have a little trouble with their fingers as you're getting older? <laughs> John 3, verses 17 to 19. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believes in him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light came into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Great was the fall of human nature in Adam's sin, but greater is the exaltation of human nature through the redemption that is in Christ. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Let's look again at Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 20 this time. Romans chapter 5, verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Signs of the Times, June 17, 1897, this was written. The life which Christ offers, offers us is more puff perfect, more full, more complete than was the life which Adam forfeited by transgression. That's the life he offers us, greater than that even, before Adam fell. And now the good news is that the redemption that the good news is that the redemption of fallen humanity has already been accomplished in the person of one. Jesus came here and become what? One of us. And in his life and in his person, fallen humanity has already been redeemed in the doing and suffering of Jesus Christ. We don't have to wonder, will it be done someday? Hopefully it'll happen. No, it's already been accomplished in one person. He cried from the cross. What did he say? It is finished. Now Romans 3, verses 23 and 24. Romans chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. You know, I'm reading all these verses this morning because the first angel's message says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having what? Everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell upon the earth and to every nation and kindred tongue and people. Do you think that maybe we ought to understand the gospel really clearly in order to be able to share it with somebody else? So we're going to Paul this morning quite a bit. We're relying pretty heavily on him. Romans 3, 23 and 24. It says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely. That word is a curious word. Being justified freely. It means to be justified without cause. There's no reason why we should be saved except for what? Because somebody loves us very, very much. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ, that is in Christ Jesus. What does it mean to be justified? It means to be declared righteous. If you were in a court, this is a word from the law courts. If uh, you're in a court of law and you uh, have been justified, what has, what has just happened? You have been removed from all condemnation. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are where? In Christ Jesus. It means to be declared righteous on the basis of Christ's doing and suffering. Now, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Over to the right a little ways. Not too far. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10.
It says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to good works. A change takes place. We're talking about sanctification here now, aren't we? Something, something happens inside of me because of what's happened outside, outside of me. We're justified because of something that happened outside of me, right? And we're justified because of something happens inside of me. A new creation has happened, right? A click. I heard the Vendon say that one day. A click takes place here, and we're born again. Let's look at another one. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. My, we can all be thankful that God has made such a marvelous provision. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. You all know this one, I'm sure. You've read it many times, no doubt. It says, For he was made to be sin. What does it say next? For us. for us. What he did, he did for us. For us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. What a promise that is. In Christ Jesus, God has already redeemed human nature in his son. And that human nature is where this morning? At the right hand of the Father in heaven. One of us is in heaven. He became one of us, didn't he? He became Hester and Steve and Alvin and every one of us. He took our place. And today he sits at the right hand of the Father in the person of our Savior. And he offers this victory to us and it's called justification. He looks at, when we give our hearts to Jesus, he looks at us as though we had never ever sinned. As we had always lived like he lived and, and spoken as he spoke and treated others like he did. That is what he has declared us to be. Now we're not that way yet, are we? <laughs> There's some problems that we still have. But if we give ourselves to him, guess what? We have a standing with God that we can't even imagine, begin to imagine. It's called justification. And this sheds great light on the incarnation. Jesus did not take upon his divine nature the sinless nature of Adam. He didn't do that. If he had, he would have redeemed nothing. Did Adam need redeeming before he fell? No. He didn't take that nature, but he took a different nature. Uh, <clears throat> such a nature did not need redeeming that Adam had before the fall. In this matter, he took me. He took you after 4,000 years of degeneration in the physical, mental, and moral faculties. The earth had gone along for 4,000 years. Is it getting better all the time? No, it had been getting worse, right? It's evolution in reverse. That's what's been happening in the world. The results of sin. And further, he went into the wilderness of temptation where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days and he didn't have anything to eat during that time. That weakened him even more, right? So besides taking our degenerate organism, the faculties, after 4,000 years of sin, it went further than that yet. Tempted by the devil, 40 days in the wilderness without anything to eat. Let's look at a couple of texts. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Over to the right. Glad well, so many Bibles here this morning. Hebrews chapter 2. Just before James. Right after Timothy. Hebrews chapter 2. You've all read this before, I think. 16 and 17. It's good to review this. Sometimes I have to hear things again and again and again before I get it. It's almost as the Lord says to us, now do you get it? Now do you really get it? Okay, here it is again. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things, how many things? All, all things it behooved him to be made like to his brethren that he might be merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Now over to the right, chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 15. 
It says, For we have not a high priest, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in how many points? All points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. The scripture is clear that Jesus took Mary's nature. You know, Mary was not immaculately conceived. There's some who teach that the immaculate conception was, was Mary. And if she was immaculate, then Jesus inherited that from her, right? But it was not so with Jesus. Mary was one of us. She was a sinner after 4,000 years also. She was not immaculate, conceived, uh, conceived, but Mary was like us when it comes to the nature of sin, the sin nature. As such, he inherited what she had to give. She had no inherent sinless nature. <clears throat> to give to him. And when the sinful nature of Mary united with the divine nature of the Holy Spirit, the sinless life of Christ was a result. There's a text that just comes to my mind. It's not in my notes. But I'd like to have you turn to it with me. It's in Luke. Luke chapter 1, verse 35. Luke chapter 1, verse 35. Gabriel talking here to Mary. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. Therefore also, that holy thing which was born of you shall be called the Son of God. Holy thing. You know, that could never be said of me. Somebody says, well, that gives him an advantage over us. We're not saved by living like he lived. We're saved by putting our faith and trust in what he did. Isn't that right? Let him have all the advantage he needs. He's my savior primarily, right? And he provides for us a perfect life in heaven above as our high priest. And he knows our weaknesses because he went through all of that. I don't understand all I know about that. <laughs> but I believe it. Wow, what a savior he is. You can read about this on page 117 of Desire of Ages. 4,000 years the race had degenerated in physical and mental moral faculties. That's part of our body, right? The brain is, is a physical organ. It's part of our body that houses the mind where we really live. Those faculties in the brain were degenerated by 4,000 years of sin. He had the same equipment to work with that we do in his body. That's to say that he participated it, this is to say that, 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 that is to say that he participated in the sin of humanity and never ever sinned. The Bible says that he did no sin in First uh, Peter 2:22. He was us with all of his liabilities, so that he could purify and restore and reconcile. That estranged nature that we all have, reconcile that to God. He's the great reconciler. The Bible says he never sinned. And that mystery of the, of the incarnation, I think, will probably be, I believe, will be probably the study of the redeemed throughout eternity. Now, Colossians 1, verse 20 to 23. We had this in our scripture reading, part of it. Colossians 1, 20 to 23. Over to the right, a few pages. Colossians 1, 20 to 23. He made peace between God and man. Verse 20 says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him he reconciled, by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him, I say, 
whether they be things on earth or things in heaven, that you, who's that? You who are far off, who's that? We're far off from him. We're 2,000 years down the line from him, right? And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies by your, in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. I, I just think that's the powerful stuff. Ephesians chapter 2. Back to the left a couple of pages. Ephesians chapter 2, 14 to 16. It says in verse 14, for he is our, what does it say? Our peace is a person. He is our peace. Who has made both one and broken down the middle wall partition between us. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in the ordinances. For to make in himself of one, of two, one new man so making peace that he might reconcile both to God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. You know, the Bible says that the carnal mind is what? Enmity against God. He slew the enmity in his person. One person. One person who's one of us, right? I think that's wonderful. On the cross, he slew the sinful nature. You read about that in Romans 6, verse 6. He took my nature and slew it. The enmity of my nature, he did away. Let's, let's look at it. It's Romans 6, verse 6. <clears throat> I don't want to leave any stones unturned here this morning on this subject. Romans 6, verse 6. Romans 6, verse 6. Back just a few pages from where we were. Knowing this, that our old man, what is our old man? That's that old nature, right? Paul sometimes calls it the flesh, calls it the sinful nature, the old man. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified where? With him. When did that happen, by the way? That happened on the cross. That the body of sin might be destroyed, that hereafter we should not serve sin. You know, after we give our hearts to Jesus, sin doesn't have a dominion over us anymore. It's not our slave master anymore. Does that mean we're sinless? No, but it does not have dominion over us. Give your heart to God in the morning. Give, it, give your heart to Jesus in the morning. Make that your very first work. And I'll tell you why. There'll be victory in your life. Whereas in Adam, humanity was sinful. In Christ, that is in his person, Humanity was remade into the very righteousness of God. We just read that in 1 Corinthians 5.21. Human nature was remade into the image of God. He took the defilement of sinful humanity into himself. And our humanity was purged. Pre presented blameless, unreprovable in the sight of God. Hebrews 1, 3, off to the right a little ways. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. It's after Timothy, after Thessalonians. Hebrews 1, verse 3. Here's what it says. Talking about Jesus again. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he sat down by himself, I'm sorry, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Where were, the, where were our sins purged? On the cross. And when he came out of the grave, he went there and sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And Ephesians 1, verses 3 and 4. We were there a little bit ago. It goes good here too. Ephesians, to the left a little ways. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with what? All spiritual blessings. And then what does it say next? 
in heavenly places where? In Christ. Every conceivable blessing has been accorded to us in Christ. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, <clears throat> this all means that when God gave his son, he gave us every conceivable blessing in heavenly places, in Christ. Do you know we don't receive anything from him? Sorry about that. We receive those blessings only where? In him. Paul uses that expression so many times. It's repeated again and again. We receive these blessings in him. You know, if we received them from him, that would be something. We'd go off and run off and do our own thing. He doesn't do that that way for us. He has a perfect humanity they took back to heaven. And these blessings all come to us as we put our faith and trust where? In him. It's a sinless man who is in heaven. I say that reverently. He is the God man. You know, there never was a being in all of, the, all, of the, all of eternity like this one, the God man. And when Jesus came here, he took on an existence that he never ever knew before. What an idea. This was brought to, brought to bear in the mind of God. God had this in his mind before the world was even made. He knew we were all going to go in this, be in this mess. And he made great provision for us. No one will be lost because they're in the old Adam. We're born that way, right? But we have, don't have to stay that way. Every believer, every true believer is in him. And when that happens, they would rather die than dishonor him. When they really see what he's done, they would rather die than dishonor him. Just so we are reckoned righteous in our new father, Jesus Christ, the second Adam. I'd like to read about the second Adam. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, just before to the left here a little bit. There are two Adams. The first Adam, we all have condemnation in that first Adam, don't we? But in the second Adam, something very wonderful happened. Verse 22, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22 says, For as in Adam we all, all die, even so in Christ shall all be made what? Alive. Alive. If you drop over to uh, verse 45, the same chapter, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. That's the first Adam. The last Adam was made a living spirit. So there are two Adams, aren't there? There's a first Adam and a second Adam. <clears throat> the first Adam was our father, right? We all spring from him. If anybody doubts that, <clears throat> think of where we'd be this morning if Adam had died before Eve conceived his fir her first son, her first child. We wouldn't be here. We were all in Adam. And that's why we're in the mess we're in, right? But God came up with an idea that he would come, God himself would come to this world and become a second Adam. And a whole new line of people that we have the privilege of being born into, we can choose that. We don't have to stay in the old Adam. We can choose now to be born again into a new family. The family of heaven. <laughs> you know the redeemed are said to, when, they, when we go to heaven, the redeemed will sit with him in his throne. That's what Satan wanted, right? You read to Isaiah 14, he wanted to sit on the throne of, uh, you, know why, you know why he hates us so much? He knows this book better than we do. He knows that the redeemed will be, will be with Christ. So you read that in, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. So what a wonderful thing this all is. In this transaction, Jesus became man as man was meant to be. In his own person, he remade the whole human family.
He remakes us. Only justified believers can love God's law. Justification is a transaction that, that is devised by God himself in which we can be accorded the privilege of having salvation and reconciliation. Is Jesus, let me ask the question this way, is Jesus fully reconciled to his Father? Yes, in Christ we are too. He loves us like he loves his own Son. Only justified believers really, will really regard God's law. Uh, everybody else is out there trying to scratch and, and to be good, and they hate God's law in every minute of it. But re justified believers love his law. It's like David, oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. I believe David was a justified believer. He had a great, huge repentance, and as a result of all this, he was, he was justified. The gospel is the good news of what God has done for, for us in Christ. In Christ, that is, in his person, one who sits beside the throne of majesty in the heavens, humanity is forgiven. In him, humanity is forgiven. That's what justification is, by the way. Humanity is forgiven, cleansed, sanctified, perfected, reconciled, redeemed, exalted to the throne of heaven. That already is an accomplished fact. One of us is there already. And he is just waiting. He's longing to come and take his people home so they can be a part of that. What an idea. And being in Christ makes us heirs to eternal life and glory. Christ's shout of victory, it is finished, assures us that it is so. In one man, the God-man, humanity is restored and already in heaven. Do you know that's, there's a text in the Bible that I often puzzled over. It's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. You know, we can have some of this in the now. Um, Ephesians 2, verse 6. I want you to see this one. And has raised us up together. What is the tense here? Past tense. Past and present. And has raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places where? In Christ Jesus. What an idea. My, I can, I can imagine that. Uh, our faith here is an experience that we can have every day. His victory is our victory. Sin shall not have dominion over you because of what Jesus did when he came here. God has nothing to hold back. He has held nothing back. When Jesus came to this earth, all the blessings of heaven were poured out in one gift for our redemption. The Bible says, God is love. We didn't love him first, but he loved us first. And we, what he wrought out for us, he freely gives to us, purely on the basis of love. Remember that little word, freely, without cause. We're justified without cause, except that he loves us. It is his goodness that leads us to repentance. Romans 2, verse 4. Notice what is included here. Uh, we won't turn to it, but it's in 1 Corinthians chapter, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. No, it's 1 Corinthians. I think we will read it. Romans 1, verse 30. Don't ever turn down reading a verse from the Bible, right? <laughs> Romans 1, verse 30. I'm sorry. <laughs> First Corinthians one verse thirty. First Corinthians one verse thirty. Here's what it says. 
having trouble with my fingers again. But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made to us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. What more can you add to that list? Anything? Now, it just happens that Romans 1.30 says the same thing. Let's turn to Romans 1.30 now. It says identically the same thing. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it talks about backbiters and haters of God, spiteful, without understanding. Okay, enough of that. Let's not misunderstand here. We don't receive all these blessings from him, but rather we receive all these blessings in him. As we give our hearts to him, we be found in him. There are many who want certain blessings. We often pray, Lord, please bless us. Do you ever pray that prayer? Lord, bless us. That's in almost every prayer I hear. We pray often, bless us. But it is vital that we don't receive any of these blessings apart from Christ. In 2 Corinthians 1.20, there's, a, there's a, a text that says, all of, the, all of the promises of God are yes, where? In Him. All the blessings come in Him. Every blessing, every promise is yes in Jesus, never apart from Him. You know, there's a text that says that. It's in Ephesians 1 verse 3. Uh, and here's what it says. Ephesians 1 verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, where? In Christ. In Christ. Every spiritual blessing, every conceivable blessing, Jim, <laughs> that's what the title is today, comes in him. The Jews were eager to, re to secure blessings, but they took those blessings and ran away with them. And they rejected Christ. And they stumbled over the fact that the only way to receive spiritual blessings was to, was to re receive Christ. They rejected that idea. We cannot receive the blessings we've talked about this morning. Forgiveness, justification, redemption. As if Christ were a cupboard where we could open the door and pull things out. That's not how we get things from him. That's not where the blessings come from. They come in him. The only way is to get into the cupboard ourselves and be in, be in him. The only way is to embrace Christ himself. And when he came into the life, into life at his resurrection, every blessing comes in him. New life in Christ. Oh, there's so many texts that talk about that. The Bible doesn't say that we receive forgiveness from him, but we, we receive forgiveness in the person. Forgiveness is a person. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, it says that he is our Passover. What does that mean? What do we know about the Passover? Blood sprinkled over the doorposts of the Israelites as they're ready to leave Egypt. Jesus is our Passover. He's our ticket to eternal life. And those, those Jews who, and I think most of them probably did, they took that very seriously. And, and he said, now we're moving out in the morning. Everyone has blood over the lentil. You won't lose your firstborn. Have your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand. Tomorrow we're moving. Moving day. You know, we're very close to moving day now. Where do you think our thoughts should be? On him. Do you want forgiveness? Jesus is your forgiveness. When you embrace him as Savior, you have forgiveness of sin. That's the only provision that has really been made is our forgiveness. No sin can remain in his presence. How do, we, how, do you, how do we access that? You know, prayer connects us to him. It's the way we receive him. If you're tempted, just go to him in prayer. And the temptation will go away, will go away in his presence. 
He chases out the money changers from our, from our soul temples. And he does that maybe as many times a day. Chases out the money changers in our soul temples. Forgiveness is more than just pardon from sin, it's past. But it means release from sin and victory over it. Romans 6 says, says that sin shall not have dominion over you. It means to be alive from the dead spiritually. Quickened. We call that a revival. Back to life. That's what it means. Back to life. You were dead in precipices and sins. He says, now I'm making you alive. You have been quickened now. We read that text. It means freedom from guilt. God doesn't just overlook our sin when he forgives us so that we can indulge in it again. He doesn't do that. It's not like the indulgences that were sold in the Middle Ages where you could pay money and then you can go out and do the sin next week. That's not how he works with this. He forgives us so we don't have to indulge in it next week. The gospel says that Jesus is the sinner's forgiveness and that we may have it freely by embracing Christ. Today, as a little appeal, I want to invite you to the commitment of a new life in Christ. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for making such a marvelous provision for us to be ushered in and welcomed into a new family, the family of Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you'll be with each one here today, all according to our several needs. Help us to make that commitment every day, Lord, so that we might be among those who will be justified believers and look up into the sky one day soon and say, Lo, this is our God, we have waited for him, and he will save us. May this be our experience as we go into a new and an uncertain week, and we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.